Chapter 38 Arya Confusion and clangor ruled the castle. Men stood on the beds of wagons loading casks of wine, sacks of flour, and bundles of new-fletched arrows. Smiths straightened swords, knocked dents from breastplates, and shooed destriers and pack mules alike. Mail shirts were tossed in barrels of sand and rolled across the lumpy surface of the flagstone yard to scour them clean. Weese's women had twenty cloaks to mend, a hundred more to wash. The high and humble crowded into the sept together to pray. Outside the walls, tents and pavilions were coming down. Squires tossed pails of water over cook fires, while soldiers took out their oil stones to give their blades one last good lick. The noise was a swelling tide. Horses blowing and wickering, lords shouting commands, men at arms trading curses, camp followers squabbling. Lord Tywin Lannister was marching at last. Sir Adam Marbrand was the first of the captains to depart, a day before the rest. He made a gallant show of it, riding a spirited red courser whose mane was the same copper color as the long hair that streamed past Sir Adam's shoulders. The horse was barded in bronze-colored trappings dyed to match the rider's cloak and emblazoned with the burning tree. Some of the castle women sobbed to see him go. Weiss said he was a great horseman and sword fighter, Lord Tywin's most daring commander. I hope he dies, Arya thought as she watched him ride out the gate, his men streaming after him in a double column. I hope they all die. They were going to fight Rob, she knew. Listening to the talk as she went about her work, Arya had learned that Rob had won some great victory in the West. He'd burned Lannisport, some said, or else he meant to burn it. He'd captured Casterly Rock and put everyone to the sword. Or he was besieging the Golden Tooth, but something had happened. That much was certain. Weiss had her running messages from dawn to dusk. Some of them even took her beyond the castle walls, out into the mud and madness of the camp. I could flee she thought as a wagon rumbled past her. I could hop on the back of a wagon and hide, or fall in with the camp followers. No one would stop me. She might have done it if not for Weiss. He told them more than once what he'd do to anyone who tried to run off on him. Won't be no beat, no, no. I won't lay a finger on you. I'll just save you for the Cahoric. Yes, I will. I'll save you for the Crippler. Vago Hoda's name is... And when he gets back, he'll cut off your feet. Maybe if Weiss were dead, Arya thought. But not when she was with him. He could look at you and smell what you were thinking. He always said so. <clears throat> Weiss never imagined she could read, though. So he never bothered to seal the messages he gave her. Arya peeked at them all. But they were never anything good. Just stupid stuff sending this cart to the granary and that one to the armory. One was a demand for payment on a gambling debt but the knight she gave it to couldn't read. When she told him what it said, he tried to hit her, but Arya ducked under the blow, snatched a silver-banded drinking horn off his saddle, and darted away. The knight roared and came after her, but she slid between two wains, moved through a crowd of archers, and jumped a latrine trench. In his mail, he couldn't keep up. When she gave the horn to Weiss, he told her that a smart little weasel like her deserved a reward. I've got my eye on a plump, crisp capon to sup on the night. We'll share it, me and you. You'll like that. Everywhere she went, Arya searched for Jack and Hagar, wanting to whisper another name to him before those she hated were all gone out of her reach. But amidst the chaos and confusion, the Lorathi swordsman was not to be found. He still owed her two deaths, and she was worried she would never get them if he rode off to battle with the rest. Finally, she worked up the courage to ask one of the gate guards if he'd gone. Uh, one of Lorch's men, is he? The man said. He won't be going then. His lordship's named Sir Amory Casterlin of Harrenhal. The whole lot's staying right here to hold the castle. The bloody mummers will be left as well to do the foraging. That uh, goat Vargo Hoat is like to spit. Him and Lorch have always hated each other. The mountain would be leaving with Lord Tywin, though. He would command the van in battle, which meant that Dunce and Polliver and Rafe would all slip between her fingers unless she could find Jacken and have him kill one of them before they left. Weasel, we said that afternoon. Get to the armory and tell Lucan that Sir Lionel notched his sword in practice and needs a new one. Here's his mark. He handed her a square of paper. Be quick about it now. He's to ride with Sir Kevin Lannister. Arya took the paper and ran. 
The armory adjoined the castle's smithy, a long, high-roofed tunnel of a building with twenty forges built into its walls and long stone water troughs for tempering the steel. Half of the forges were at work when she entered. The walls rang with the sound of hammers, and burly men in leather aprons stood sweating in the sullen heat as they bent over bellows and anvils. When she spied Gendry, his bare chest was slick with sweat, but the blue eyes under the heavy black hair had the same stubborn look she remembered. Arya didn't know that she even wanted to talk to him. It was his fault they'd all been caught. "'Which one is Lucan?' she thrust out the paper. "'I'm to get a new sword for Sir Lionel.' "'Never mind Sir Lionel,' he drew her aside by the arm. "'Last night, Hot Pie asked me if I heard you yell Winterfell back at the Holdfast when we were fighting on the wall. "'I never did!' "'Yes, you did. I heard you, too. "'Everyone was yelling stuff.' Arya said defensively. Hot Pie yelled Hot Pie. He must have yelled it a hundred times. It's what you yelled that matters. I told Hot Pie you should clean the wax out of his ears. That all you yelled was go to hell. If he asks you, you better say the same. I will, she said, even though she thought go to hell was a stupid thing to yell. She didn't dare tell Hot Pie who she really was. Maybe I should say Hot Pie's name to Jack and I'll get Lucan. Gendry said. Lucan grunted at the writing, though Arya did not think he could read it, and pulled down a heavy longsword. This is too good for that oaf, and you tell him I said so, he said as he gave her the blade. I will, she lied. If she did any such thing, Weiss would beat her bloody. Lucan could deliver his own insults. The longsword was a lot heavier than Needle had been, but Arya liked the feel of it. The weight of steel in her hands made her feel stronger. Maybe I'm not a water dancer yet. But I'm not a mouse either. A mouse couldn't use a sword, but I can. The gates were open, soldiers coming and going, drays rolling in empty and going out creaking and swaying under their loads. She thought about going to the stables and telling them that Sir Lionel wanted a new horse. She had the paper. The stable boys wouldn't be able to read it any better than Lucan had. I could take the horse and the sword and just ride out. If the guards tried to stop me, I'd show them the paper and say I was bringing everything to Sir Lionel. She had no notion of what Sir Lionel looked like or where to find him, though. If they questioned her, they'd know. And then Weiss. Weiss. As she chewed her lip, trying not to think about how it would feel to have her feet cut off, a group of archers in leather jerkins and iron helms went past, their bows slung across their shoulders. Arya heard snatches of their talk. Giants, I tell you. He's got giants. Twenty feet tall. Come down from beyond the wall. Follow him like dogs. Not natural coming on them so fast. In the night and all. He's more wolf than man. All them stocks are. Shitting your wolves and giants. The boy'd piss his pants if he knew he was coming. He wasn't man enough to march on air and all, was he? Ran another way, didn't he? He'd run now if he knew what was best for him. Eh, so you say. But might be the boy knows something we don't. Maybe it's us ought to run. Yes, Arya thought. Yes, it's you who ought to run. You and Lord Tywin and the Mountain and Sir Adam and Sir Amory and that stupid Sir Lionel, whoever he is. All of you better run or my brother will kill you. He's a Stark. He's more wolf than man. And so am I. Weasel! Weasel's voice cracked like a whip. She never saw where he came from, but suddenly he was right in front of her. Give me that! Took you long enough! He snatched the sword from her fingers and dealt her a stinging slap with the back of his hand. Next time be quicker about it! For a moment, she had been a wolf again. But Weiss's slap took it all away and left her with nothing but the taste of her own blood in her mouth. She'd bitten her tongue when he hit her. She hated him for that. You want a nutta? Weiss demanded. You'll get it, too. I'll have none of your insolent looks. Get down to the brew house and tell Truffleberry that I have two dozen barrels for him. But he'd better send his lads to fetch him or I'll find someone who wants him worse. Arya started off, but not quick enough for Weiss. You run if you want to eat tonight, he shouted, his promises of a plump, crisp cape and already forgotten. And don't be getting lost again or I swear I'll beat you bloody. You won't, Arya thought. You won't ever again. But she ran. The old gods of the north must have been guiding her steps. Halfway to the brew house, as she was passing under the stone bridge that arched between Widow's Tower and the King's Pyre, she heard harsh, growling laughter. 
Rorge came around a corner with three other men, the manticore badge of Sir Amory sewn, sewn over their hearts. When he saw her, he stopped and grinned, showing a mouthful of crooked brown teeth under the leather, leather flap he wore sometimes to cover the hole in his face. Yorin's little cunt, he called her. Guess we know why that black bastard wanted you on the wall, don't we? He laughed again, and the others laughed with him. Where's your stick now? Rorge demanded suddenly, the smile gone as quick as it had come. Seems to me I promised to fuck you with it. He took a step toward her. Arya edged backward. Not so brave now that I'm not in chains, are you? I saved you. She kept a good yard between them, ready to run quick as a snake if he made a grab for her. Oh, you another fucking for that, seems like. Did your and pump you, cunny? Or did you like that tight little ass better? I'm looking for Jackin, she said. There's a message. Rorge halted, something in his eyes. Could it be that he was scared of Jack and Hagar? The bathhouse! Get out of my way! Arya whirled and ran, swift as a deer, her feet flying over the cobbles all the way to the bathhouse. She found Jack and soaking in a tub, steam rising around him as a serving girl sluiced hot water over his head. His long hair, red on one side and white on the other, fell down across his shoulders, wet and heavy. She crept up quiet as a shadow, but he opened his eyes all the same. She steals in on little mice feet, but a man hears, he said. How could he hear me? she wondered, and it seemed as if he heard that as well. This scuff of leather on stone sings loud as war horns to a man with open ears. Clever girls go barefoot. I have a message. Arya eyed the serving girl uncertainly. When she did not seem likely to go away, she leaned in until her mouth was almost touching his ear. Weiss, she whispered. Jack and Agar closed his eyes again, floating languid, half asleep. Tell his lordship a man shall attend him at his leisure. His hand moved suddenly, splashing hot water at her, and Arya had to leap back to keep from getting drenched. <clears throat> When she told Truffleberry what Weiss had said, the brewer cursed loudly. Now you tell Weiss my lad's got duties to attend to. And you tell him he's a pox-ridden bastard, too, and the seven L's will freeze over before he gets another horn of my ale. I'll have them barrels within the hour, or Lord Tywin will hear of it. See if he don't. Weiss cursed, too, when Arya brought back that message, even though she left out the pox-ridden bastard part. He fumed and threatened. But in the end, he rounded up with six men and sent them off grumbling to fetch the barrels down to the brew house. Supper that evening was a thin stew of barley, onion, and carrots, with a wedge of stale brown bread. One of the women had taken to sleeping in Weiss's bed, and she got a piece of ripe blue cheese as well, and a wing off the capon that Weiss had spoken of that morning. He ate the rest himself, the grease running down in a shiny line through the boils that festered at the corner of his mouth. The bird was almost gone when he glanced up from his trencher and saw Arya staring. Weasel, come here. A few mouthfuls of dark meat still clung to one thigh. He forgot, but now he's remembered, Arya thought. <clears throat> it made her feel bad for telling Jacken to kill him. She got off the bench and went to the head of the table. I saw you looking at me. Weese wiped his fingers on the front of her shift. Then he grabbed her throat with one hand and slapped her with the other. What did I tell you? He slapped her again, backhanded. Keep those eyes to yourself, or next time I'll spoon one out and feed it to my bitch. A shove sent her stumbling to the floor. Her hem caught on a loose nail in the splintered wooden bench and ripped as she fell. You'll mend that before you sleep, Weiss announced as he pulled the last bit of meat off the cape, and when he was finished, he sucked his fingers noisily and threw the bones to his ugly spotted dog. Weiss... Arya whispered that night as she bent over the tear in her shift. Dunson, Polliver, Rafe the Sweetling, she said, calling a name every time she pushed the bone needle through the undyed wool. The Tickler and the Hound, Sir Gregor, Sir Amory, Sir Illyn, Sir Marin, King Joffrey, Queen Cersei. She wondered how much longer she would have to include Weiss in her prayers, and drifted off to sleep dreaming that on the morrow, when she woke... He'd be dead. But it was the sharp toe of Weiss's boot that woke her, as ever. 
The main strength of Lord Tywin's host would ride this day, he told them as they broke their fast on oat cakes. Don't none of you be thinking how easy it'll be here once my lord of Lannister is gone, he warned. The castle won't grow no smaller, I promise you that. Only now there'll be fewer hands to tend to it. You lot of slugger beds are going to learn what work is now. Yes, you are. Not from you. Arya picked at her oat and cake. Whis frowned at her, as if he smelled her secret. Quickly, <clears throat> she dropped her gaze to her food and dared not raise her eyes again. Pale light filled the yard when Lord Tywin Lannister took his leave of Harrenhal. Arya watched from an arched window halfway up the Wailing Tower. His charger wore a blanket of enameled crimson scales and gilded crenet and chamfron, while Lord Tywin himself sported a thick ermine cloak. His brother Sir Kevon looked near as splendid. No less than four standard bearers went before them, carrying huge crimson banners emblazoned with the golden lion. Behind the Lannisters came their great lords and captains. Their banners flared and flapped, a pageant of color, red ox and golden mountain, purple unicorn and bantam rooster, brindled boar and badger, a silver ferret and a juggler in motley, stars and sunbursts, peacock and panther, chevron and dagger, black hood and blue beetle and green arrow. Last of all came Sir Gregor Clegane in his gray plate steel, astride a stallion as bad-tempered as his rider. Polliver rode beside him, with the black dog standard in his hand and Gendry's horned helm on his head. He was a tall man, but he looked no more than a half-grown boy when he rode in his master's shadow. <clears throat> a shiver crept up Arya's spine as she watched them pass under the great iron portcullis of Harrenhal. Suddenly she knew that she had made a terrible mistake. "'I'm so stupid,' she thought." Weiss did not matter, no more than Chiswick had. These were the men who mattered, the ones she ought to have killed. Last night she could have whispered any of them dead if only she hadn't been so mad at Weiss for hitting her and lying about the cape and... Lord Tywin, why didn't I say Lord Tywin? Perhaps it was not too late to change her mind. Weiss was not killed yet. If she could find Jack and tell him... Hurriedly, Arya ran down the twisting steps, her chores forgotten. She heard the rattle of chains as the portcullis was slowly lowered, its spikes sinking deep into the ground, and then another sound, a shriek of pain and fear. A dozen people got there before her, though none were co was coming any too close. Arya squirmed between them. Weiss was sprawled across the cobbles, his throat a red ruin, eyes gasping sightlessly up at a bank of gray cloud. His ugly spotted dog stood on his chest, lapping at the blood pulsing from his neck, and every so often ripping a mouthful of flesh out of the dead man's face. Finally, someone brought a crossbow and shot the spotted dog dead while she was worrying at one of Weiss's ears. Damnedest thing, she heard a man say. He had that bitch dog since she was a pup. This place is cursed, the man with the crossbow said. It's Helen's ghost, that's what it is, said goodwife Amabel. I'll not sleep here another night, I swear it. Arya lifted her gaze from the dead man and his dead dog. Jack and Hagar was leaning up against the side of the wailing tower. When he saw her looking, he lifted a hand to his face and laid two fingers casually against his cheek. <laughs>